Okay, well, I'll tell you what. If you would, why don't you open up for the last time to the Gospel of John. And uh, we've been in the Gospel of John for about a year and a half or so. And, uh, um, uh, and I, have to, I have to tell you, uh, any of you who have spent time teaching Bible studies and that and have used things like commentaries, uh, when you spend time with these various authors, pastors of the past and everything for a year and a half, um, it's almost like saying goodbye to a couple of old friends and stuff as you sort of put them back on the shelf and, and realize it's going to be a while before you're back in the gospel again. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's I've, I've mentioned this along the way many times. There is something precious about looking at the life of Jesus uh, through the eyes and the pens, as it were, the quills of those who wrote about him in the gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And in particular, my favorite gospel is John's. It's probably some of yours as well. And part of the reason for that is because it is uh, so wonderfully personal. It's not just a, an account of the facts, which the other Gospels are more so than John's. John has a very personal touch to his writing. You can, uh, uh, you can sense that as you read through it. And so to come to the end of this book is personally sad for me. It might be very great for you guys. You might be tired of it by now. But, uh, um, but uh, it's a sort of a, a fond farewell to this book. But anyway, that being said, if... Uh, We're going to be in John chapter 21 today, and if John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, create a prologue to the gospel, then chapter 21 is its epilogue. Um, There is some uh, discussion, dispute might be, that's a fair word, might be a little strong, but there's some discussion about uh, how much of John 21 John may or may not have actually wrote. Some uh, theories are that uh, it was written by those in Ephesus who Uh, who served alongside of him before his passing. Uh, As you know, John was banished to Patmos after they tried to kill him. Uh, He's the longest living disciple of the uh, apostle of the 12. Um, And he lives to be into the 90s, at the end of the first century. It's generally pretty widely accepted. And so, um, but there are some things that are unique to chapter 21, as far as the wording, terminology, and those kinds of things that don't find a place elsewhere in the gospel. However, Um, Again, some of those things are disputed because some of those terms and phrases show up in John's epistles. And so there's some discussion about some of that. But I would suggest this. Uh, It seems clear enough that John wrote most, if not all, of chapter 21. And if it wasn't him personally, it was those who were alongside of him who knew him. But we also do know this, and this is one reason why I do think it's, it's original to John. And that's that we have no record or copies of the gospel that were circulated without chapter 21. And so even if it was written by those with him uh, toward the end of his life or after the end of his life, uh, the gospel itself didn't begin to make the rounds until chapter 21 had been written. And so at least the best we can tell. So that being said, um, I'm going to take the tack that John actually did, in fact, write it, though. Uh, But chapter 21 begins with these words. After these, oh, by the way, one of the reasons that that view is held is because chapter 20 is a pretty nice, tidy ending to the gospel, isn't it? These things were written so that you would believe, right, and the the purpose for the gospel. That being said, though, um, the epilogue, the final chapter of John's gospel, is a a wonderfully uh, important and meaningful one. And so chapter 21 begins with, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. In other words, he made himself known again, Uh, After the previous appearances, we'll see where John will mention that this is now the third time in his recording that Jesus appeared to the disciples uh, as a group after the resurrection. Now, the Sea of Tiberias, by the way, is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, And so it's the same body, although John always refers to the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberias when you you see it mentioned in the Gospels. Um, But as they're around the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, by the way, as Jesus had told him he would meet them there. Elsewhere in Matthew, we see it in uh, chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14. He talks about meeting them afterward here. In verse 2, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, or twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, in other words, James and John, and two other of his disciples were together. We don't know for sure who the other two were, although it's generally uh, often viewed as maybe being Philip, maybe James, uh, the other James, and so we don't know for sure. But we do know uh, James and John, the brothers were there, Uh, Peter was there, Uh, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, and such. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. 
And they said to him, We will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Um, A lot has been said about this verse, about the mood of the disciples at this point. Uh, And and I'm not sure I agree with much of what's generally been said. Usually when you come to this passage, there is this sort of um, kind of... uh, not defeated, but this sort of sense that they're going, like they're going back to their old life a little bit. This whole thing is over and they don't know what's next and all that. But you have to factor in the, the idea that Jesus actually has already appeared to them twice. This is not just a day or two after the crucifixion. This is now, as John will say, the third time that he will have shown up to a group of them. And so to think that they're somehow despondent or defeated because they don't know what comes next might not necessarily be fair uh, reading into the text. Um, what I think is likely, uh, very at least possibly more the case, likely might be too strong, but at least possibly the case, is that they were going back to that which they knew because the truth of the matter was they had to provide for themselves. They had to work. They had to do things. Many of the disciples throughout their ministries, to, at least Paul we know for sure, took on uh, work in order to provide for himself and his ministry team oftentimes. Um, the disciples, uh, at least four of them, possibly seven of them we know were fishermen. And so they're going back to that which they know in order to make a living, to provide for themselves, and just go back to what they knew while they figured out what was next. Um, They had not yet been endued with power from on high in Jerusalem, as Jesus will tell them to wait. That comes after this point, apparently. Um, And so there's time in between. As a matter of fact, Jesus appears to the disciples, and not just the disciples, but it would seem also that which Paul refers to. Matter of fact, when we turn there in 1 Corinthians 15, During the 40 days that Jesus appeared to his disciples, it is likely that what Paul refers to in chapter 15 was also taking place during that same period of time, where Jesus appeared not only to his disciples, to others as well. And so uh, in verse 5, after he had died uh, uh, died for our sins according to the scripture and been buried and raised again according to the scriptures, in verse 5 it says that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Now, again, as we mentioned last time, somewhere between the resurrection and the first appearance in the upper room, it would seem that that is where Jesus met with, with Cephas, or Peter. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, we see this also in Luke 24, where the two disciples on the road to Emmaus come back with word, not only that Jesus appeared to them, but that he also had appeared to Peter. And so we don't know exactly where that fit in, but it seems that it was likely at that point. But after he rose from the dead, he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, which, by the way, was just the name for the group. There was actually 11 of them at that point. Uh, Judas had hanged himself. But generally, when we speak of the apostles, we're speaking of them as a group, and the 12 is sort of a, a synonym for that with them. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Jesus appeared during that first period of time after the resurrection, prior to the ascension, and prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit, he had appeared to a lot of people. I like how Paul makes the point in saying that he appeared to over 500 at one time, many of whom are still around. Why would you say that, if not to challenge people who are wondering about the truth of the claims to go ask? There are people among an enormous number who at one time saw him, and you can ask them about that. There are many, many proofs for the resurrection, which is important for us because the resurrection is fundamental to our faith. It's not an afterthought. It's not secondary. It is central, just as the cross is. Uh, If you have the cross without the resurrection, then there is no knowledge that, in fact, Jesus' death paid for our sins. In other words, he may have had sin if he could not, in fact, conquer death by not having any sin. There's a lot of implications to that. But Peter, uh, Paul, I should say, makes the point that Jesus appeared after the resurrection to a lot of people uh, during that period of time. And then he ultimately ascends. We see this at the end of Luke. We see it at the beginning of the book of Acts. So... Uh, So my sense is that they're not so much despondent and feeling like this is over and I don't know what in the world we're going to do with our lives now, but they're just waiting. They've got time in between before ultimately the Holy Spirit comes upon them and then they go and begin the ministry that Jesus has called them to after his departing. And so, um, but they caught nothing. 
But when the day was now breaking, verse 4, Jesus stood on the beach, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Uh, so Jesus said to them, Children, do you, not have, uh, you do not have any fish, do you? It's actually an interrogative statement. And they answered, No. This is already shaping up like a familiar story, isn't it? Um, now, when they say no, my guess there is that they are, in fact, despondent because they've been out all night fishing and they've caught nothing. And they've been in this situation before. Now, Jesus is on the shore, but they don't recognize him. Now, we'll see in a moment that they're about 100 yards off the shore, about 300 feet, 350 feet or so away from the shore. So they can't actually see who he is on the shore. And they apparently didn't recognize his voice either. And there may be other things at play too, which we'll discuss more in a moment. But Jesus calls out to them and he says, you haven't caught anything, have you? Of course, he knows the answer to that. And they say, no. And so watch what Jesus does next. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, from a fishing standpoint, this is an absurd request. Okay, oh, they're they're on the the port, the starboard side now, I guess, or whatever it is. And so, uh, a Galilean fishing boat is not like a little, you know, like Babe Winkleman size, you know, thing. Uh, a a Galilean a fishing boat that we're referring to here would have been about 20 to 25 feet long, about 8 to 10 feet wide, and it would handle four to seven or four to ten fishermen, roughly, and the nets and the fish that they would hopefully bring in. And the goal was that you would be able to carry a lot of fish so you wouldn't have to keep going back and forth. Uh, and so not only that, but we'll see here in a moment, there's also a smaller boat that aids in the bringing into the fish as well, uh, as would have been not, not terribly uncommon. And so here they are in this boat, and they've been out all night. Now, not all seven of them are on the fishing boat at this point. There's some of them that are waiting on the shore, waiting in the smaller boat for a catch so they can all then bring in uh, the fish. The reason being is that the larger boat uh, would dock somewhere, it wouldn't, or it wouldn't necessarily get back, run aground until you were done, because it was a lot of effort bringing this thing on and off the sand. And so you'd have a smaller boat that would help bring the fish from the larger boat to the shore. So the larger boat is about 100 yards out. Jesus calls out, haven't caught anything, no. Well, throw your nets on the other side. And so they do. Now, they didn't argue. They didn't know it was the Lord, but... They were tired, but somehow they just felt like doing it, and so they did. And all of a sudden, they caught, as we'll see in a moment, 153 large fish. Um, at that moment, I wonder, like, like we'll see John recognizes it's the Lord, but you've got to wonder what they're thinking as this begins to explode in their minds a little bit. Like, we've, we've been here before. As a matter of fact, the Sea of Galilee is where... Uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John were called. And so this is the area where Jesus taught from the boats and then told Peter to push off. Lord, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. Nevertheless, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And a large number of fish come in, so much so that the nets were breaking. And Peter tells Jesus to go away from him, for he's a sinful man. There'll be a very different response this time. The, the circumstances are different, but there's something about it that I have to wonder. At what point they started to think, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, and all of a sudden John sp speaks up here in verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Peter and John remember what it was like the first time this happened about three years earlier. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. But the other disciple came in a little, little boat. seems like Peter's jumping and running and all that kind of stuff, and John's a little more taking his time or doing things differently. But Peter just... Now, remember who we're talking about when we say Peter. Uh, you know, we could spend time talking about his impetuousness and all that. He just puts on the garment, jumps in the water, and starts swimming 100 yards to shore. But think of the enthusiasm and excitement. And think about it in light of the fact that it wasn't all that long ago that Peter had been denying the Lord, even after a bold statement of how faithful he would be. He's had an epic collapse since then. And so because of that, some, because of his, his, his 
response here, his not being shy about going to see the Lord at this point, we wonder if maybe in that meeting that Jesus had with him, apparently privately, apparently individually, because he's, he's singled out as Jesus having met with him sometime after the resurrection, uh, we wonder if in that moment uh, Jesus restored him after this epic failure. And if so, then what comes next that we're all familiar with might in fact be more of a recommissioning than a restoration. But we'll see. We don't know for sure. But there's a lot of interaction there that we understand when we see the whole picture from the Gospels. That it's not as simple as, hey, the last time Peter saw Jesus was when he denied him. No, he's actually seen him twice in the upper room, once without Thomas, one with, once individually at some point. And now this is the third time that together they're actually seeing Jesus. And so it helps us round out the picture a little bit and helps us to maybe question and wonder a little bit about what's going on through Peter's mind and his interaction with the Lord and everything. But Peter jumps again in the water. He swims to the shore. John and, and the others, they, they begin to bring the boat back and everything. And, um, and so uh, verse 8 again, but the other disciple came in the little boat, uh, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging a net full of fish. Uh, and so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already had uh, been laid and, and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land. Okay, so here's the picture. They realize it's the Lord. They've got a net full of fish still in the water. The normal thing would be to bring it onto the boat and then come in. That's not what they're doing. They just start making their way back, dragging a net full of 153 large fish. Well, nets, empty nets have drag. Imagine like, like trying to row to shore with a parachute behind you kind of a thing. And uh, so as they get close to the shore and they jump out of the boat and they see there's a fire already there, Jesus has already started making breakfast for them. Um, and, 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 and he says, well, why don't you grab some of the fish that you guys caught and bring it over here as well. Now, Peter by himself pulls the net onto the shore. This is a strong man. This is what fishermen were like. This is how strong of a man he was. Uh, he is called by some commentators the big disciple or the big fisherman. Uh, he's a manly man. This is a guy who, frankly, is easy for most of us to relate to in a lot of ways. Um, he, is, he is not a theologian, although his letters are wonderfully instructive and obviously inspired of God. I would even say eloquent in some regards. But he's not a theologian per se. He's not somebody who stops and thinks things through before he acts. We see that frequently through the Gospels. And it's things like this that endear him to us a lot. As a matter of fact, one of the things that probably endears us to him the most is the fact that he failed so miserably, you know, and was restored so wonderfully. You know, there's, you can look at Peter and say, you know, uh, if God can transform, change, restore somebody who failed that specifically, that personally of the Lord, then certainly there is grace for us, right? I used to have this awful, uh, awfully misguided understanding about people in the scriptures before. Uh, Jacob, I, I, I always assumed I was reading him wrong because if I, if I was reading correctly, it seemed like he was kind of a cheat, uh, that he lied and he deceived people and stuff. And I thought, well, he's in the Bible. How can that be? You know, Peter denying the Lord. You think about that. This is one of Jesus, if not, you know, Jesus closest friend, you know, um, somebody who was certainly closer to the Lord than most anybody who has ever walked the face of the earth proximity wise relationship wise and he failed so hugely but yet nonetheless after the resurrection the angels tell the women go tell the disciples and Peter that he's alive Jesus specifically takes time and meets with Peter along the way here in a moment we'll see this passage we're again also familiar with but Jesus sort of speaks specifically to Peter it may be that the other disciples were around and kind of overhearing it but Jesus was talking directly to Peter about some things. Um, there is wonderful hope and restoration even after the worst of failings. I have a dear sweet friend many years ago who had a lot to do with my own uh, Christian growth uh, and discipleship and even salvation. And he had uh, a couple of absolutely colossal failures. Humiliating, devastating. 
Um, but to watch God's grace restore him uh, probably meant as much to me as the warnings of what not to do and the failings that he experienced. But watching him be restored, and he serves in ministry today, 20, 20 30 years later, whatever, so many years later, but full and total restoration. There is such hope in the gospel in knowing and drawing close to Jesus. Uh, a broken reed will not break, a smoldering flax will not quench. He knows exactly how to meet with us in our times of being devastated. Verse 11, again, Simon went up and drew the net onto the land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Again, different detail. Also, the uh, number of fish that was caught. Um, there are those uh, that take a very spiritual kind of bent on the scripture and try to come up with some symbolic thing with 153 and all this kind of stuff. I think it just bears witness to the fact that it was an eyewitness testimony. Somebody was there, and they actually counted the fish, and he's recording it. Um, but there's 153 fish, which not only tells us that somebody clearly, John, was there observing this, but it also is quite a big deal for Peter to pull this onto the land. And also the nets held together. Uh, the one thing I will say, without trying to sound like one of these spiritual people I was just talking about, uh, people that spiritualize, spiritualize the text, is that Jesus is the one who told him to put the nets in the water, just like last time. But here, for some reason, the nets don't break. And I'm just reminded of the fact that whether it was the first occasion back in Luke 5 or whether it's this one here now, that Jesus does give us what we need to do that which he tells us to do. Uh, here in this particular case, we see all this coming in. The fish were there, just like Jesus expected them, or who knows, for all we know, commanded them to be, whatever the case. But Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. What an odd statement. In a way, it sounds funny to think like, you know, I dare not ask Doran who he is because I know who he is. You know, it's, what is that? There's something strange about this sentence. And when you see after the resurrection in the Gospels, it seems that on first appearing, or on at least at some point in the course of appearing, a lot of people are confused with who he is and don't recognize him. You know, Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener. Um, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him until he broke bread with them. Um, in this particular case, was it that they didn't, they recognized him, but yet there was something about him that caused them to be a little iffy about it, but they knew it was him. Um, one suggestion, which is heartbreaking, but I tend to lean toward, is, um, is that he may very well be retaining the scars that he bore at the cross for us, that he received at the cross and the scourgings and all of that. Um, in the book of Revelation, John sees a lamb as it had been slain. He sees Jesus in all of his glory too, but there's also this moment where he sees him as a lamb who was slain. And that has caused many to, to wonder, at least wonder, uh, if in fact he still, even to this day, may retain those scars. Now on the one hand, that's a horrifying thought for us. Because to see him that way and to recognize that that is because of me is gut-wrenching. But it's also an eternal display of his deep love for us. And that he was willing to take that on, if in fact that is the case, that that remains an ongoing memorial to what he did out of his deep love for us. But in any case, here on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, they know it's him, but there's something odd in, in his appearance or something about his, his being there that, that, that causes them to have some element of question. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. And this is now again the third time that Jesus was made known to them or manifested to the disciples uh, after he was raised from the dead. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, for you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him yet again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, 
shepherd or tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Um, this is one of those places where looking at the Greek is helpful. Um, there are two words that are used here for love between the interchange between Jesus and Peter. Um, of course, you know, uh, you're familiar with some of these terms, agape, right? We talk about 1 Corinthians 13. We talk about uh, God so loved the world. Uh, passages like this, we see the word agape at play. The word agape is this other-centered, Christ-like, giving, sacrificial kind of love that is very easily uh, used when speaking of Jesus or the Father, you know, demonstrating love. Um, another word is the word phileo, which speaks of a brotherly kind of a love, a, uh, the kind of love that you and I might show one another as Christian fellowship and this kind of thing. Now, on the one hand, John uses these two terms pretty interchangeably throughout his gospel, and even in his epistles we see sometimes. But especially in the gospels, all the time it's used, both words are used somewhat interchangeably. And so, uh, there, on the one hand, uh, it could be said that you don't want to read too much into the fact that they were using different terms in this conversation. On the other hand, John knowing uh, the gravity of what is going on here in that, um, I see as being very deliberate in choosing these two words. Uh, and, if, and if so, here's what's at play. Jesus sort of pulls Peter aside. Again, the other disciples may have sort of been around, but he's clearly addressing Peter. And he says, do you love me more than these, agape? Um, the more than these, by the way, is the subject of some debate. Is he saying more than the other disciples? which may be the case because it was Peter who in the upper room said, all these might forsake you, but not me. Do you in fact love me more than these do? Um, on the other hand, the tense of the word there could imply that he may be talking about, do you love me more than like these fishing boats and doing what you were doing before and things like that. There's a little bit of the jury being out on that. I tend to think he's sort of bringing Peter back to the upper room for a moment. Not to slam him down or embarrass him or humiliate him, but as we'll see, to restore him ultimately. But he asks Peter, do you love me, agape? Do you have this all-sacrificial kind of love for me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know I love you, phileo. I have a strong affection for you. Peter is likely a little hesitant to be using the kind of bravado in his answer that he did in the upper room, and understandably so. Um, now, Peter likely has sort of been, you know, brought back a little bit in this prior meeting that took place at some point, but there's still restoration taking place. And so Peter, Jesus goes on and says a second time, Peter, do you love me? Agape. Lord, you know I love you. Phileo. Peter, do you love me? Third time. Phileo. Peter's grieved now because he's asked the third time. Likely grieved, not just because he's having to feel like maybe he's proving to the Lord that he really means it, but maybe because he's realizing that three times the denial, three times the restoration. Maybe there's just something heavy and grabbing his heart about this. And Peter responds again, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Not only the word love, but when Peter says no, you know me, you know all things different words there in, in between two. It's an actually a very beautiful exchange back and forth that is intended to bring Peter all the way back. You'll notice attached to each of those responses of Jesus is feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. Sheep, lamb, both different words. Uh, one implying lambs, young. Sheep, older, possibly speaking of the fact that Peter, I want you to ultimately serve and minister to those who are young and old. But there is this sense in Peter's heart where he may be grieved in the moment realizing and maybe in remembering in this interchange what's going on with his three denials. But Jesus is restoring him. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed them. Minister to them. Peter becomes the premier pillar in the church for the first 
12 chapters or so of the book of Acts. And then it becomes very specifically focused on Paul. But Peter is clearly... Now, I, I want to make sure that I don't diminish who Peter is because, again, I've mentioned in the past I grew up Catholic, you know, where Peter was the Pope. And so sometimes when we talk about Peter on this side, now being a born-again believer, um, the natural tendency is to try and take Peter down a notch or two from that position that he's been given by that particular denomination. But that's not fair. Uh, Peter was not the first pope. There is no succession of popes, biblically speaking. Um, There's no succession of of apostles and that kind of a thing. Uh, The body of Christ perpetuates as the gospel goes forth. And there are leaders and there's people like that, but not with apostolic authority like Peter and the rest of them had. That's a very different thing entirely. But that being said, uh, we don't diminish Peter. For all of his failings, for all of the times we sort of have fun talking about the humanness of Peter and that, Peter was a giant, not just in physical stature. He was not just a big man, but he was a big personality. He was hugely used by the Holy Spirit. Uh, This is a guy who even, you know, even the hypocrisy that he gets called out for by Paul, we read about in Galatians and that. Peter is human, but to deny how God used him, right? And, and Peter himself is likely not even imagining that anything like that could be possible at this point. Peter knows what he's made of now. You know, this exchange right here is kind of reinforcing that. And it's actually kind of a healthy thing that, you know, that Peter maybe has had to dial it down a notch or two from the time in the upper room. It's helpful and it's healthy because as Jesus had taught them in the upper room, that the way up is the way down. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you'd be the servant of all. Uh, They were always arguing about who's the greatest until the greatest gird himself with a towel and washed their feet. And so Peter is no doubt piecing so much of this together and whatever, whatever, self-confidence and self-reliance he might have had before is certainly been brought down significantly. And that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Because God was going to use Peter dramatically. In the upper room, as they gather together and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they burst out and they begin to speak in tongues and declare the great, uh, the glory of God and everything there on the day of Pentecost, it is Peter who speaks up. 3,000 get saved that day. 3,000 men, right? We don't know the total number, but at least 3,000 got saved. Uh, it is Peter alongside with John, but Peter is sort of the focus. He's the one who's, uh, whose speaking is cued in on when they raise the, uh, the, the, the man uh, at the gate there, at the beautiful gate, who's uh, paralyzed, and, they, and Peter says, get up and walk. It's Peter who becomes the mouthpiece for the disciples for a long time. It's Peter who opens the door of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He's used hugely, but as uh, I think it was Tozer, maybe it was Tozer who said that before God uses someone greatly, he has to first, do you say, wound them or break them deeply? That's a healthy thing. So as we learn from Peter's life, we learn about the the deep, bold love for Jesus that that he had in the same exchange. Notice, do you love me, Peter? Lord, you know that I love you. He uses a different word, but he, yes, you know I do. Like he, just, he just, it, it just can't be hidden in him. Again, not to keep bringing up the failure, but failures though he had, his love and devotion to Jesus never diminished. His humanity unfortunately got in the way, but his heart never departed. We think about people in Scripture who we could think the same thing about, someone like David. David, king by which all kings in Israel are measured, man after God's own heart, man who committed adultery with a man and then had him killed so that he could look good marrying this man's wife so that when she had a baby, everybody would think it was theirs inside of their marriage. Despicable in every imaginable way. But yet David is used greatly by God. Were there consequences? Of course there were. But nonetheless, God continued to use David. And again, David is the standard by which all kings in Israel are measured. And so we never want to be too hard on Peter or any that we see in Scripture who stumbled and fell and then got picked up again. 
because in them we see a very clear picture of what all of us are like. And the same grace that was available to them is available to us. And here we see Jesus exercising and extending that grace and restoring Peter from such a low place to a place where he will ultimately serve him. As a matter of fact, Jesus will go on now and explain the ultimate price that Peter will pay for proclaiming Jesus' name. He goes on in verse 18 and says, Truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk uh, wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and, and bring you where you do not wish to go. And now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And so Jesus gives an indication here about how Peter's going to die. And there's some details here that are worth examining. Um, Peter is going to, uh, whereas Peter at this point in his life, and certainly when he was younger, was experiencing a certain measure of freedom, the time will come when he will no longer be free. When you were younger, you got yourself dressed, you went where you wanted. But the day is coming where someones they're going to come and get you, and you're not going to be in charge of your life, and you're going to stretch out your hands. That is a euphemism for be crucified. Um, there were two terms in the New Testament that tended to speak to that. One was be lifted up. The other one is uh, stretch out your hands. And so what, is, what Jesus is telling Peter is that he is going to die by crucifixion one day. And tradition tells us that when Peter did die by crucifixion, traditions hold that Peter made the request that he be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. His devotion never waned. Um, Now, he also says that when you're old, right? Interesting thing in the book of Acts, when Peter is arrested, uh, we see in, um, is it Acts uh, uh, 11, I think, where Peter, where James is killed by Herod Agrippa. And this pleases, uh, you know, the Jews in, in, in the area there. And so he says, well, I'll, I'll go get Peter next. And so he arrests Peter. And it's at the Passover, at the beginning of the, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so Peter's in jail either from the beginning of that week or during the week. It's some, some amount of a week, if not an entire week, he's in jail. And he's in jail waiting to die. They just killed James, and now Herod's going to kill Peter in order to keep himself kind of ingratiated to the, you know, to the people he's in charge of. And so on the night before he is to be killed, Luke is very specific there in the passage. He says, now, the night before he was going to be killed... Peter was in his cell, sound asleep, chained to the guards. So there are two guards that he's chained to, and there's two at the, at the gate in front of where he's being held, the cell essentially that he's being held in. And he's chained to them, and he's sound asleep. Now, if you were going to die tomorrow, you might be thinking of other things you'd want to do. I mean, you're going to have plenty of time to sleep in a little while, you know. So you probably wouldn't be copping some Zs, you know, right before you're about to be, you know, killed. But Peter is sound asleep. And I don't want to read too much into it. It may very well be that he was just excited that he was going to die and go be with the Lord. Or it was, it was within 10 years that that took place of the, of the resurrection. It was within about 8 to 10 years of that time when that took place and Peter was arrested. Maybe 5 to 10, but somewhere, you know, a little time has gone by, but not that much. Did Peter remember what Jesus told him? When you're old, they'll take you away and they'll do this. Was Peter just sort of expecting it some way to get out? Who knows? I don't know. Of course, he is released. An angel comes and gets him out of there. But Jesus is giving Peter a bit of an indication as to what his life is going to look like down the road. And it was dramatic. Peter served the Lord faithfully. With the one exception we mentioned, but he served him faithfully throughout the rest of his time. His two letters at the end of the New Te toward the end of the New Testament are so rich in, in fulfilling that which Jesus told him to do. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. These two letters are so rich and profound in instruction for believers. Uh, and, and he just faithfully went on that. Even though we don't know what happened to him really after Acts 15 at the council in Jerusalem, we don't really see him again. But we do know from his writings later on that he remained faithful. And we do know that ultimately he was martyred. He was crucified for the Lord about 20 or so years before John wrote these recorded these words of Jesus. Now, and he says, follow me. Now, 
I want to just one more time point out that Jesus is recalling, recalibrating, recommissioning, if you will, Peter at this point. And these simple words are essential. Follow me. Now we'll see that come up again, which is why I just want to emphasize that. One more time we'll see that, that command in just a second. Verse 20, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Um, so he's, in other words, he sees John. And so Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Um, now, again, we're, we're, unfortunately, we don't have the inflections. We don't have the... We can't see them walking and see Peter look behind as he, you know, well, what about this guy? Or well, what's going to happen to him since you're kind of explaining what's happening? What about John? We don't know exactly why he asked the question or anything like that, but something about that question um, was a distraction that Jesus corrected. And so Jesus responds by saying, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. The word you is there. It's emphatic. Before it was follow me. Fulfill that which I've called you to do. Here's what's going to happen to you in the years to come. Follow me. Stay close. Walk with me. Well, what about this guy, Lord? Hey, what did I just tell you? <laughs> you follow me. You know, again, it's very emphatic. Uh, there, is, there is one person who you and I are each in charge of in our Christian life. Yeah, that's right. I'm responsible for me. And I have a responsibility in what I do as a pastor to teach and all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for you. You know? I mean, I do believe that there's a, you know, and there was, again, the responsibility. But you're not going to stand, you know, I, I don't mean to be picking on being formerly a Catholic. But my sense of things as a Catholic was pretty common. And that is that we all thought we were going to heaven as Catholics, partly because we were the true church, you know, that was kind of the mindset. Um, but the other thing was, is because if you followed the rules right, then you get in. I did everything the priest said. I went to communion every Sunday. I went to confession often. I did my best to follow the Ten Commandments, all that kind of thing. I, 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 I lived out the faith that the priest told me I was supposed to live. But if you stand before the Lord as an unsaved person, saying, I did what the priest told me all my life is not the key to getting in, right? Jesus meeting with Nicodemus, or Nicodemus coming to Jesus that night, Nicodemus begins to talk about, you know, hey, we know you're a teacher, come from God. Nobody can do the things you do unless God's with him. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Just gets right down to it. He says, Nic Nicodemus, you must be born again. Not just generally, but you. Right? You and I are each responsible for our own lives. And while we do well to, in care and loving concern, come alongside of our brothers and sisters and help them to grow in fellowship and all the things that the body is supposed to do, when it comes time for who's responsible for each one of our faith, we are. We are responsible for our own. Um, you know, uh, young people, God has no grandchildren, just children. Every one of us stands before God based on our own faith, our own response to his grace. But we are responsible for that. Peter, don't worry about John. You follow me. Now, as he goes on, uh, therefore, the saying went out among the brethren that the disciple, that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? In other words, a rumor, a misguided rumor started from this exchange. And that Jesus may have been saying that John was going to be alive until Jesus came. That's not what Jesus actually said. Which, by the way, from a Bible study perspective, uh, it's important that we look at what the words actually say. Uh, how many times did Jesus fall on the way to... Uh, I think we talked about this. So I might have blown it already. But how many times did Jesus fall on the way to Golgotha when he was carrying the cross? Three? No. No. The Bible never says. Yeah, I mean, it's not three, right? It's just the idea. We think three. Why? Because tradition tells us it was three. 
and we all saw The Passion of the Christ, and he fell three times in that movie. So, but, you know, the fact is we are sometimes victims to what we, what do they call it, the Mendelssohn effect or the Mandela effect or something? We sort of have a lot of those in the Bible. We, um, there was a, a Turner of all things, a Turner Broadcasting Network movie on the life of uh, Moses. That I'll be darned if it wasn't one of the most accurate depictions, biblically speaking, that I've ever seen. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene where, where Moses stands with his arms raised over the, you know, over the Red Sea, and he stands there all night until in the morning the waters part. Now, I did not remember the detail that he stood there all night, and so I went and looked it up, and there it was. I just thought, raise his hands. We all saw Charlton Heston's version, right? So it's like, we're all this, and also we see the waters start to go like it just happened right away. It didn't. Moses stood there all night with his arms and the staff raised, and then in the morning, basically, the waters began to part. And so there's a lot of these sorts of things. Now, those are kind of cute and funny or whatever, but, but there's lots of things that we sort of just take for granted from memory or from what we just sort of were brought up with or we feel like we talked about it in a, in a discussion or a Bible study group and we sort of don't go back and read the passages for what they say and we sometimes draw wrong conclusions from that. Now the ones I just described were kind of innocuous in a way but sometimes they can be deeply theological and so we want to make sure that we actually look at what the scriptures say and let them say what they say and build our understanding based on what they actually say rather than what we sort of maybe have been conditioned to think is there. And so anyway, this is a very early example of that kind of thing happening where they heard what Jesus said, but they sort of jumped to a conclusion here instead of really considering what Jesus actually said. And so John didn't live until Jesus returned, although ironically, not ironically really, I guess, he did actually see the coming of the Lord, didn't he? In the book of Revelation. So there was some kind of tr truth to that interpretation of it. But they took it literally that, Jesus, that John would be alive until Jesus physically came back. But in the Revelation, he does actually see that. And as we mentioned earlier, John is the longest living disciple. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's not that Jesus said he would, in fact, live until he returned, but just that if I want him to remain. Now, verse 24, this is the disciple who is testifying of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John is very, very big on the testimony that he bears. He talks like this in 1 John as well. Um, the value of the eyewitness testimony of this. Your faith in mine is not based on just simply hearsay. The kinds of stuff that is used as evidence in the scripture to demonstrate the reality of the resurrection, the reality of the deity of Christ, the reality of all the things that the scriptures talk about, is based on the kind of eyewitness testimony that would stand up in a court of law. I mean, well, well, you know, what if I can't see Jesus? Okay, well, what makes you think you would believe even if you could? There's a whole population of people who rejected him when he was standing right in front of him. Jesus was right when he told the rich man that, you know what, if I send Lazarus back or whatever, that if I send someone back from the dead, uh, or in telling that story, when uh, uh, you know, Abraham says if someone comes back from the dead, they won't necessarily believe. That's true. And so what do we have instead? We have evidence that we can essentially take to the bank, something that we can make a strong case. The Christian faith is the single most reasonable understanding of eternal and spiritual things because of the person of Christ. Now, again, this is the disciple who is testifying of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. The we there, again, may refer to those in Ephesus with John when he passed. And verse 25 and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I would suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. The end. Um, so the, the Gospel of John, the life of Jesus. Um, any thoughts or questions before we pray and close? Yeah, Andrea. By the way, Andrea's in town. If you didn't notice, say hi while she's here. High priest, servant, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Peter is no doubt quite courageous, really. I mean, we sometimes lose that in his impulsiveness, but there's some bravery in that, right? I mean, it's just, he kind of throws himself into that, even though, you know, Peter wasn't a swordsman, he was a fisherman, right? And so clearly there were better people with a sword than him around, but that didn't matter, you know? Yeah, right on. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. And thank you for giving us time to go through the life of Jesus, as John recorded it. We pray that, Father, our coming to know him better uh, would permeate every part of our lives. That, Father, we would seek to walk with him, to know him, to be like him. We are, after all, modern-day disciples. And so help us to walk in his ways, to learn how he speaks, what he does, as best we can, the way he thought about things and did things, Father. We want to be like him, not for our own glory, but for his. So, Father, we just pray that as we grow closer to him and more like him, that the world would see him through our testimony. That, Father, we would sort of fade off into the distance as the glory of Jesus would shine forth. Thank you, Lord, for that lofty invitation and opportunity. And thank you that, Lord, you've not asked us to walk it alone or to try to do it in our own strength, but you've sent the Holy Spirit ultimately to help us in this regard. And so we pray that he would have free reign in our hearts and our lives, cleansing us perpetually of those things that so easily beset us, those sins so often time, but even just the distractions, the worldviews, whatever it is that would be outside of that which Jesus would think or do or say. And help us to more and more be like him. Father, we praise you and we thank you. And we ask you just to have your hand upon us as we continue to make our way through your word as well. And let each, uh, each experience in your word, each time we open the pages, whether here or at home or wherever we are on our own, that each one would be an adventure of drawing closer and closer to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.